morning, everybody. Welcome to the creek. Please stand and join us in worship. See you later. 
to worship through the word, Lord, we ask that you to speak through John, that you're speaking through him this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Um, that's what it means to be corrupt. And, and I'm of the opinion that, that there are some people 
um, out there who they they look for reasons to be corrupted, so then they can act in a corrupt fashion. Right? They look for something bad to happen to them because if something bad happens to them, then it's very very easy for you to act corrupt. Right? You can lie and you can treat people badly and you can talk to people however you want. And right, I'm just going to give that person a piece of my mind. Well, we call that a jerk. Okay. Um, right? They look for for reasons to do that. Why? Because if you have a teacup, if you have, um, God bless coffee, right? good coffee, not Folgers, okay, good coffee. Um, um, if, if you have a coffee cup, you're only going to see what's in the coffee cup if you tip it over. So if you, if you get out of the heart, a person's mouth speaks, right? So it, it takes something significant to kind of tip your teacup over, tip your coffee cup over, and then you're going to see what's inside of it. And this is what's going on here. These people are so corrupt and they've missed the mark so badly that God says, Hey, Jonah, I need you to go talk to these people. And corruption within a culture does something fascinating. It breeds distrust. So it does. So you have an entire city, what God says, a large city, several hundred thousand people. And not one person can trust the other person because everybody in the city is just so proud. You just can't trust people. Uh, and Jonah's purpose, and so God says to Jonah, you need to go to these people. And when God says that to people all throughout the Old Testament, what do we call that? We call that a prophet. So Jonah's purpose in life was to be a prophet. And then the question becomes, well, what is a prophet? A prophet is someone who goes to another group of people to foretell a possible future. That's what a prophet is. Right? Um, all throughout the minor prophets are 12 books of the Bible. Um, Jonah is one of them. And they all follow the same three-point structural outline. And it goes like this. Um, this is what you've done. This is what God will do if you don't repent. Will you repent? Of all those 12 books of the Bible, all those little those flyover books, right? That uh, Joel, Amos, Jonah, Obadiah, Jonah, Michael, 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 all those books, they follow that same basic structural outline, okay? If, it's God going to a people group and saying, this is what you've done. Um, this is what I will do if you don't repent. Will you repent? Okay, so that's the overall structural outline of the book of Jonah. And so Jonah is this prophet that is, 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 was tasked with going to Nineveh to foretell a possible future to the Ninevites should they not repent. Okay? And then we get to uh, verse 3. Um, instead, so Jonah hears this, right? Instead, Jonah immediately heads off to Tarshish to escape the commission of the Lord. Now, geographically, if you knew where Tarshish was, you would see that Nineveh is this way, and Tarshish is that way. Now, there is some extra-biblical literature um, that I won't spend a lot of time on. I'll just briefly cover it here, okay? But we shouldn't be too hard on Jonah. Okay? Uh, there's some extra-biblical literature that seems to indicate that Jonah's father was murdered by the Ninevites. Okay, so we need to be very careful, right, about judging Jonah, okay? Um, these people were awful, awful people, and Jonah had skin in the game, all right? So we need to be careful. That would be like one of us, you know, if, if God, uh, you know, came and talked to one of us and said, uh, hey, I want you to go... Um, to the capital of Syria, and there's this huge group of uh, several hundred thousand uh, ISIS people, and you need to go witness to them because their wickedness has come to my attention. And we would say the exact same thing that Jonah says. You're out of your mind, God. I'm not doing that. That's nuts. And Jonah literally says, these people can go to hell. But that's what he says. That's what the text says. These people can, I don't care if they all die and go to hell. I'm not going to do that. 
right? And it's kind of easy to understand when we put it in these modern terms, right? You know, ISIS is popular vacation tourist destinations today. <laughs> Not so much, okay? Um, so that's what's going on uh, in verse 3. And so um, uh, Jonah says to God, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go in the opposite direction. I'm going to get on a boat, and I'm going to go in the absolute opposite direction. And so that's what he does. And in verses 4 and 5, we kind of see um, the uh, immediate uh, consequences uh, of those actions. Uh, it says, uh, But the Lord hurled a powerful wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. <clears throat> now the lesson from this, uh, these two verses is very, very clear. Forsake your destiny. Forsake the thing that God has tasked you to do in life. And your life will become very, very stormy very, very quickly. That's what happens. We see it time and time again. You've probably seen it in your own life. If you haven't seen it in your own life, you've seen it in other people's lives. Right? So we need, to be, we need to be watchful for that. If you don't embrace the meaning of your life, your life, like that ship, will begin to break apart. And like these sailors, if you have no moral grounding, if you have no spiritual foundation, you will cry out to every single God you can, except for the one God who can do anything about your situation. That's the matter. We see it all the time. Okay? So that's what, that's what these men did. They started to cry out to, to all these gods. And what did they try to do? They, tried, they, they started to throw their cargo overboard. Their cargo had absolutely nothing to do with it. Absolutely nothing to do with it. But they couldn't, they couldn't discern that at the time. Okay? Well, where's Jonah during all of this? Uh, well, uh, the second part of verse 5 tells us that Jonah had gone below deck, and he had laid down, and he had fallen into a deep sleep. Now, what is that? What does that mean? It means that Jonah has checked out of his life. And there is this massive storm going on around him, but Jonah does not want to engage in that level of suffering, and so he just checks out. Know anybody like that? Right? That's what's going on here. To be asleep in life is akin to forsaking your destiny. That's what it means. Right? You're not living a conscious life. You're not living uh, your, your, what's a good way to say it? You're, you're living life in an unconscious manner. Right? You're a zombie. You're walking around, but you're not really doing much. You're just kind of taking up space on the earth. Okay? And so that's what um, is happening here. And when you're asleep, you are unable to assertively make choices in the world. You're not able to do anything about your situation. You're asleep. Right? And so your ship can begin to kind of break apart as you're on it. And you might not even be aware of it, but other people who are on your ship will definitely be aware of it if they're awake. Okay? And so that's what we see in verse 7. <clears throat> the other sailors determine that it's Jonah's fault. Verse 7 says... Uh, the sailors said to one another, come on, uh, let's, let's cast lots to find out whose fault it is that this disaster has overtaken us. So, the casting lots was a, a common thing in that time. Okay, and so we, we shouldn't really be judgmental about that. Um, these guys are, are on the right track. Okay, even though they're not believers, they're on the right track. They know that something terrible is happening to them, and they know it's not natural. But that's how bad this was. That's how bad their situation was, right? So they're they're casting lots. They're kind of like, okay, what is going on here? And as they cast lots, surprise, surprise, 
Jonah's name comes up. Hey, Jonah, we think this is your fault. Right? And so, uh, Jonah admits fault. Now, part of what's going on here, like why did they cast lots? Uh, well, part of it is because they, they lack that spiritual foundation and they cannot determine the difference between something bad and chaotic and catastrophic happening in life that's just random, right? Because there's an arbitrary nature to life. I think we can all agree to that, right? There's an aspect of life that sometimes you just get lucky, right? And sometimes you just get really unlucky. There's just an aspect of that to life. Okay, so we need to be careful. We need to be judicious when we think about this concept. But there is a, there, there's that aspect to life. But these men know something is going on, but they can't determine between something chaotic and random happening and God's divine judgment. They can't do that. Why can't they do that? Because they don't know God. Oh, but Jonah does. So that's what we see in verses 9 and 10. So Jonah admits fault, and he says to them, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And hearing this, the men became even more afraid and said to him, What have you done? The men said this because they knew that he was trying to escape from the Lord because he had previously told them. <laughs> so here are these four guys are again, thinking, Oh, well, you know, our gods are made of you know, wood and stone, and, you know, Jonah, he has his gods, so and his gods probably made of wood and stone, too, so it's probably ultimately meaningless. Um, so he's running away from his god. We really don't take our god seriously. What's the big deal? Turns out it's a really big deal. And what is the meaning of this passage, psychologically speaking? Um... <clears throat> There are times in your life when you will be involved with a group of people, you will be involved in an organization, and there are people who are sabotaging the organization and they know it. And if you throw them overboard, the organization will get better. That's what this means. So Jonah admits fault, okay? Uh, or better, actually, if you can get these people to leave willingly without throwing them overboard, um, that's, a, that's a better scenario, okay? Um, so Jonah admits fault. And uh, these guys, uh, don't, they don't really want to throw them overboard, interestingly. Um, they don't really want to do that, I think because they kind of know what it means for Jonah, right? If we throw this guy overboard, He's going to die. Right? And isn't that fascinating that in our own life we kind of find ourselves doing the same thing? Right? You can have that friend or something, or you've done that. I've certainly done that. You know, you intentionally keep people in your life and you know that they're bringing you down. Right? That old adage, you know, one bad apple corrupts a whole barrel. Like, but where do we get that adage? We get it from Scripture. That's, that is part of our collective Judeo-Christian heritage. We get that from the idea that, that what is said in Scripture is true, and that is, do not be deceived. Bad company will corrupt good morals. And this is fascinating that the passage starts off that way. Don't be deceived. Don't trick yourself. The tendency is for people to think that it doesn't work this way, but it really does. That's what the text is saying. And so that's what's going on here. But we don't want to throw these people out of our lives. We don't want to cast them overboard, so to speak. Why don't we want to do that? Because we know what it means to them. We know what that means. It means that the chaos and the waves of their life could overtake them and they could drown very, very quickly if we do that. And we think that we're the ones in charge of keeping their ship intact. But we're not. Okay? So Jonah says to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea and make the sea quiet down because I know it's my fault you are in this severe storm. Jonah knows he is at odds with God. He knows this. And um, he knows what they must do 
if they're going to live. Now, water too, um, in the field of psychology, uh, sometimes people will have dreams and they'll share it with me and say like, you know, John, uh, water is a, is a perennial theme in dreams, okay? You, people will feel like I'm swimming as hard as I can and I'm not getting anywhere. Or I feel like I'm drowning and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, I'm just barely being able to stay above you know, the, the surface of the water. And what does the water represent? The water uh, is representative of the unconscious. That's what the water is, okay? Now don't be freaked out by that. All the unconscious is, we all, is, is what, what state you are in when you're asleep, okay? And that's what water is representative of, okay? And so what's going on here uh, is that uh, Jonah knows that he's going to be thrown into the sea, and he knows that the sea is very, very rough, and he's probably going to seek, seek into it, or sink into it. And as he does that, there are good things. You know, if you kind of sink into your unconscious, a lot of times as we grow, we're supposed to mature. And we figure things out about ourselves. Like, hey, wow, I used to act this way. And I realized that that's not a super healthy way to act. And now I've stopped that and I act this way. Well, at some level, you discovered that. Right? Well, how did you discover that? Well, you sank below the surface of your conscious waking life and you started to think deeply about your life. That's how you did that. Right? And the deeper you go, the more foreign the world gets. Right? The darker it gets. Um, Alexander schultz wrote a fantastic uh, three-volume book called The Gulag Archipelago, uh, which chronicles his experience and the experience of uh, several other people who lived uh, during the uh, Russian time of the gulags and uh, Stalin and Lenin were responsible for killing what we don't really know because they killed so many people we couldn't even keep track of it. Uh, but at least 60 million people of their own people. And so he chronicles that and he writes some fascinating, fascinating things in the Gulag Archipelago. It's a very, very dark book. Uh, you better have a full meal on your belt if you're going to read that book. I encourage people to read it, but it's very, very dark. And one of the things that he says is he says um, that the line between good and evil runs down the heart of every human being. Is that something? Like that's probably worth thinking about for like the next 10 years. Um, okay. So, um, they throw him into the sea. Okay? And uh, Jonah is on the surface of the sea, or what we might understand as this chaos, right? And um, God sends a giant fish to swallow him. That's where we get uh, chapter, uh, verse 17. The Lord sent a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And what does that mean? It means that when God abandons you because you've abandoned what God wants you to do, the storms of your life will overtake you very, very quickly. The chaos of life will overtake you very quickly. And what we see often is that there is some terrible thing that comes and swallows you. And you will have to spend some amount of time in a very, very bad place until you understand what God has tasked you to do in life. And so that's where we find Jonah. He is swallowed uh, by this giant fish. He's, he's become overwhelmed by the waves, and he sinks into this awful place. And he's, he's sitting there in this, this terrible, terrible place. And the whale, again, it's that monster that lurks in the unknown. Right? And, and we, we've seen all these things, right? Your, your life is going along very well, uh, pretty smoothly. You're very comfortable, you're very certain about the future, and then all of a sudden, you get a text. Everything changes. You get a phone call. One person comes in and starts talking to you. We've had that happen. That's how quickly you can find yourself in the belly of a way. Is that what Right? So that's where Jonah finds himself. And Jonah decides that he's going to repent. Um, he's going to say, okay, you know what? Um, <laughs> God, you've got my attention. It took a little while, but you have it now. 
And so the whale vomits him up. And we see that in uh, chapter 2, verse 10. The Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out. And the lesson there is that if you repent and embrace what God has for you to do, um, you might get a second chance. But be careful, friends, that he lest you take too long in the belly of a whale, that you don't get a second chance. But that's one of the terrible, terrible truths of life. Right? We don't want to think that way. Uh, but if you don't know what God has tasked you to do, and I'm not speaking about what God has tasked you to do in a specific sense, right? Like, it, certainly God can speak that way because he, and work that way in people's lives because he did it in Jonah's life. But what we tend to see, this is a different dispensation. And so what we tend to see in this dispensation is how does God speak to people now? He speaks to people in very, very general terms. Are you lying? Are you, are you cheating people? Are you talking to your spouse or your child in a way that you know, you know, deep down in your heart, you know that's not the way to talk to them? Are you doing those things? Don't be surprised if the chaos and the ways of life overwhelm you and you find yourself in the belly of a whale. You ought not to do that. Why is that? Well, because God has tasked you with something greater than what you're doing. And I was the same way. There was a time in my life where uh, I realized um, that I think probably, you know, I, I came to this conclusion, you know, when I was, I was young, um, 22, 23 probably, uh, where pretty much everything that I said was a lie in one form or the other. And that's a strange, strange thing to think about. Because then you think about, like, well, if that's true, like, what am I? And I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I was, you know, super, you know, much worse than the people that I hung out with or, or, or better than the people I hung out with. I was probably somewhere, you know, in that average range. But it, what, and what was I lying about? Well, I was lying about things to impress people. Right? I was lying about things um, that, you know, um, because I'm competitive and I like to win, uh, I would lie about things that, uh, you know, I knew wasn't right, but I would win the argument if I said it. Right? Uh, those types of things. And when you come to that realization, um, <clears throat> you're, you're faced with a very, very strange phenomenon. Uh, are you going to continue or are you going to allow... Um, something that, that Scripture talks repeatedly about to happen to you. The refiner's fire. That's what it is. You can choose to embrace the truth, but the manner in which God works for you, if you choose to embrace, embrace the truth, is a kind of burning. That's what it feels like. There's pieces of you that are, that are burnt off like, like dead wood. And some people, you know, they've made such a wreck out of their lives that they, they kind of wonder, you know, they start that burning process and then they wonder, like, man, alive, um, is this ever going to end? Is there anything, is there any, like, real part of me? There's something real there. Absolutely there is. There's something real there. And you say, like, well, what if it's, what if, what if, God keeps refining me, and there's only like 20% of what's left. Well, isn't that 20% worth more than all those things? Right? That's the refiner's fire. <clears throat> it, it is all throughout uh, the Old and New Testament. Isaiah says that I have been tried as silver and gold, and God has placed me in the furnace of Ooh. That's what it is. It melts you. And that's what happened in Jonah's story. Right? God will, God, the, the searing heat 
of reality, of the suffering in this world, because we live in a sinful, fallen world, it will melt you if you do not have some kind of foundation to stand on. If you do not possess that, as the Old Testament prophets would say, woe be unto you. Woe, uh, that Hebrew word means uh, damned. Right? When Isaiah says, Woe am I, for I am a man of unclean lips. He, he's saying like, He has seen the glory of God, and he knows his own sinful, wretched state. And he says, Woe am I. I'm going to go. He thought he was going to go to hell. I'm damned. Woe. I cannot do what God wants me to do. And so he had to pass through the refiner's fire. Right? So that's what Jonah had to do. Jonah had to spend some time in the belly of the whale. And he had to pass through that refiner's fire. And he had to, he had to, he had to get himself in formation. And he goes into Nineveh, and we know the rest of the story. Uh, he goes into Nineveh, and he's not even really enthusiastic about it. He basically, I mean, he, he just kind of like walks through the city, and he's like, hey, God wants you to repent. That's all he does. Well, what's the lesson there? Start by doing it badly. Of course you're not going to do what God wants you to do the first time around really, really well. Just start. Like, well, John, it's, it, I'm not really happy about that. Do you think John was happy about that? Of course you're not happy about that. It's terrible. These people are awful. They're crucifying people. They're wicked, corrupt people who are constantly missing the mark in everything they do all the time. Just start. People come to me all the time and they say, John, I feel like I'm stuck. And my response is always the same. <clears throat> you're not stuck. And when you figure out that life doesn't happen to you, it happens for you, your whole life's going to change. And that's what happened with Jonah. And when you're in the belly of a whale, it's really, really hard to see that life is happening for you. But oh boy, is it. So some takeaways. <clears throat> if you don't know <clears throat> what you need to do, the seas of your life will become stormy. And you'll have to spend some period of time in a terrible place until you get your life figured out. And why doesn't God just tell us? Well, number one, He has told you. Right? Micah tells us that. He has shown you, oh man, what looks good, what the Lord requires of you. He has shown you in a general sense. Okay? Um, so, yes. And number two, uh, God values free will. He wants you to make the choice. There's value in that. Right? Um, second point. Uh, what are you avoiding? Or maybe more to the point, um, uh, what are you knowing that God wants you to do and you're avoiding that thing? And then all you have to do is sit for three to five minutes and think about that. We all have those things in our life where we know that we're supposed to do something. We know that you know, in the next 10 to 15 minutes after we walk out of these doors, there's something that we can change in our life that can make it measurably better. Now, conversely, 
It's not obvious to me that just because you find yourself in a bad place, that you should stay there. Well, it, 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 isn't, it isn't fun. Yeah, so you should move. You shouldn't stay there. But people do it all the time. They give up. They just throw their hands up. They say, ah, it's so terrible. I, 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 just, I, just can't, I just can't do this anymore. Do you know what's going to change if you, if you, if you really believe that? If you say, like, well, I, I can't change this. I have no control over this. Nothing's going to change. It will get worse. Because if you stand still in life, that doesn't mean life's going to stand still. Life is always moving away from you. It always. That's the psychological significance of the Star of Bethlehem, right? The, 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 the wise men followed the Star of Bethlehem, and as they followed the star, the star moved ahead of them. That's life. There's no stasis. There's no standing still. You stand still. You get stuck in life. Life's going to move away from you. And if you stay stuck long enough, life will move so far away from you, you can't see where you need to be. And that's a very, very bad thing. So take that first step, right? I encourage all of you to do that. Um, <clears throat> lastly there, uh, Christ did two things that Jonah did, but Christ did them perfectly. The very first thing he did is that he took responsibility for his suffering. That's what Jonah did. That's what repenting is. When you say, man, why? I blew it. You're taking responsibility. I, I joke around all the time. I've been doing this for years, and I'm going to write the, the shortest counseling book ever. Right? It's going to be on how to apologize. And there's just going to be one page. On the middle of the page, it's going to say, Say, I'm sorry. Now shut up. <laughs> That's how to say apology. Just. That's it. You take responsibility. Well, but John, some of all that responsibility isn't mine to take. Take responsibility. Just take it. In our culture, that is a rare, endangered thing. Right? People literally don't know what to do when you do that. You say, hey, I am really sorry about that. I blew it. Oh. That's, thank you, that's, that's a, okay, thank you, that's okay. That's the response you're going to get. Okay? Second, Christ confronted wickedness face to face, just like Jonah did. And you can face the worst there is and prevail. And you can know this because our Savior did. With that, friends, I want to thank you again for having me. I hope that this was useful for you. Thanks.